Um, the power, the power of prayer is real. Yeah. The power yeah. of the, the the brotherhood of Jesus is real. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you let you know how I, I know and how I figured that out. It took me a long time because I'm hard headed and uh, everything. Um, I want to learn my way, but I realize it's not my way that got me where I'm at. It's Jesus. That is right. It is His way that's where I'm at. Uh, Brother Monroe, uh, Brother Lee, Brother Barnhart, um, Brother Nice, uh, these these gentlemen, they don't realize that they got me where I'm at today. Mm, mm, mm. And I love each and every one of them yes, yes, yes. as a brother in Christ, but as a brother in my family as well. Uh, Saturday morning, we get five of us come into prayer. Um, I think we started our prayer at three thirty. Um, it was glorious. You could feel the spirit between the five of us. Yeah. Uh, there was, there was <laughs> I felt the more tremendous of spirit between five of us than I did within a group of a hundred. Yeah. And 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 I was talking to Andrew about it, and I was like, "This is how I feel. This is this is it." And he was like, "Because within a hundred people, not everybody comes for the same thing, right? Yeah. But everybody is hungry. Everybody needs the yeah. blood of yeah. Jesus. Yeah. 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 The, he delivered me Saturday morning from something from a burden that has been bothering me." The past two days before that, I slept an hour and 45 minutes total mm -hmm. in two days. And it's, it's, it's a burden that I didn't realize that was weighing on me as much as it was. But we was praying, and it, as we were praying, I was right here, right here in this spot. I was on my knees. I was screaming. I was, it was, it was, all of us were, it was, oh my goodness. We were in tongues. Every one of us were just going, we were going at it. And the Lord it was like he took my soul out of my body, released the bag, and stuck it back Woo! in. Yes! And it was like, it was, it was, it was, it was so glorious, and it was, it was like, the, I felt so light, but I was so exhausted. I was so exhausted afterwards. I was tired. I didn't have no strength. Um, it was, it was glorious. It was a beautiful day. Um, my goodness. My goodness, but that, that goes to show you the power of the brethren, the power of the spirit. Uh, if you come together, it, it, you know, you may not can conquer it by yourself, but you can conquer it with people. Yes, around. yes, yes. That's yes. why we have a church family. That's why we have right. each other. Right, yes. right. But I love each and every one of you, and I want to thank you, and I can't thank you enough, and I know we can't thank him enough for being there for us. Amen. Amen. Um, Amen. Let's have a wonderful service. Yeah, I'll take from there. Right? <laughs> I'm over here vibrating. <laughs> What's he talking about? It's the Holy Ghost. Right. Some people say the Holy Spirit. Ghost is just the depart, the spirit of a departed one. So that's how it, the old English says ghost. It's spirit. And so when you get the Holy Ghost, things happen. How I many know that God's alive? Yes. Yeah. And when you're in sin, you're dead. Yes. But when God gets on the inside of you, you become alive. Come on. Right. And things you could never get a handle on, God just snatches that right out of your life. Every day, every day. Right. We fix this preaching here. <laughs> now look, I got, I, got little, I got some teaching I want to do. I want people in the picture. I want them to understand. And I may even open it up for a question or two. If everybody just hold all your testimonies till after service, I want to get through this and I want to see what God's going to do, okay? Amen. Baptism of the Spirit is, is so misunderstood. Where do we get knowledge from the Word of God? If you don't believe in the Word of God, we have no common ground where, where to draw our knowledge from. If we can't agree that the Word of God is the Word of God, there's, we have no common ground. You can't go to a science book. You can't go to some theologian or some uh, philosopher. You can't get knowledge from many places and try to bring it together and agree at one. You just can't. We have to agree that the Word of God is the Word of God. We all agree? Come on. 
How many know that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. So if he did something way back in the day, he's doing it today, he will do it tomorrow. Amen. Okay, you're all bobbing and nodding. That's good. Stay with me. I got some history we gotta we gotta get through. Um, there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of Luke. Anybody know who Luke is? I'll answer it. So you don't say no. Luke was a man. He was not a called disciple. He was not one of the twelve. He was, he was nowhere in the ministry of Jesus is Luke mentioned. Uh, nowhere on the day of Pentecost is Luke mentioned. Nowhere in the beginning of the church is Luke mentioned. But Luke has an important role, and he played it well. Luke is a historian. Uh, in history, we know he was a physician, so he's an educated man. He can write. And if you read the Gospel of Luke, it comes. it's an educated view of the life of Jesus. Luke was a smart man. He was observant. How many know that doctors, their job is to observe, to record, and then treat? So he, he observed what happened, he recorded it, and then he presented it. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to Luke, the first chapter. We're going to start the first verse. Luke, Luke, Luke. It says this. For as, uh, as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. He's talking about the other, the, the other uh, writers of the gospel and, and, uh, and writers. Paul wrote many books. And, uh, you know, you think all these books were written at the same time. They're not. These are men's written accounts. And, and back in history, it wasn't like they published it on the New York Times and one day everybody had a paper. It wasn't on the Internet. This was something that was, was written down. It was copied and it was sent out. It says, even as they delivered them unto us, which were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. It must be a friend, but they don't really know him. Uh, that you might know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke opens up with a, with a description of himself. He's writing this letter. He's doing it other men have done, writing these letters. And he's, he's doing it from a perspective of a first-hand witness. How many know what a first-hand witness is? You are all first-hand witnesses of my preaching today. You're present. You're here. You're listening. You're getting all the nuance of the room. We're recording this, and, and, and three months from now, somebody might watch it, but that's secondhand. They weren't present. They're not feeling what we're feeling. So he was a first-hand witness of the works of Jesus. He brushed shoulders with the disciples. He saw Jesus heal, do miracles, signs, and wonders, and, and for prosperity's sake, and to memorialize it, he wrote it all down. So we have a history of it. This is not a second-hand view. This is a first, I was there. When someone says, I was there, I, saw, I know what I saw. This is Luke saying, I was there. I know what I saw. I wrote it down, and we all agree. That's what I just read in those first verses. He concludes his, his letter in Luke 24, 46. And in that conclusion... Uh, he is writing and he is quoting Jesus, starting at Luke 24, 46. And said unto them, this is Luke recording what Jesus said, Thus is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance, this is Jesus speaking, and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Ye, and ye are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Luke is recording a statement that Jesus made before he ascends up into heaven about something that is to come. His life was the culmination. The all four gospels are the culmination of his worldly existence and ministry. 
but they all point to something else. What's beyond, when he died, what, what was beyond that? Even the disciples, they, they were, you know, when Jesus was crucified and he died, they were all just, just messed up in their minds. But well, now what? Now what? He's gone. We thought he was going to be our king. Now what? But the writers write all the thoughts these guys are having. Well, he said, Terry in Jerusalem. We all need to go to Jerusalem. And so the disciples get together and, and they all head to Jerusalem. And, and the Bible says, and we pick up the story in Acts 1. There's something you have to pay attention to because the Bible is linear. It's, it's straight. It, it, it starts here and it takes you somewhere. From the, from the first chapter of Matthew all the way to the last chapter of Revelations. It's, it's, a, it's a continuous movement towards something. Amen. It picks up all the pieces and lines them up. So we have a complete understanding. We don't have to sit in doubt and in darkness of what God's doing in this hour because what happened back then, we don't know what happens today. But God's linear. He started it, and it'll go on until he finishes it. Luke wrote a second book. You can say the second book of Luke. And, and people look at me cross-eyed, huh? What Bible are you in? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what Bible I'm in. I'm in the Bible. Because in Acts, the first chapter says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So he's referring back to the book of Luke, his first book that he wrote, about the whole entire life and ministry of Jesus. Uh -huh. He's bringing us from the gospel, from the old law, into grace, into the New Testament. How many know the Gospels are all Old Testament? That's right. They're in the New Testament. Yep. But they're, they're the end of the Old Testament. Because with Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, his blood shed, oh. it sealed that Old Testament. Thank yes. God. Yes. Yes. How many know what book the church starts in? Anybody? Acts. Acts. We're in it right now. <laughs> oh, I'm getting all bubbly. <laughs> That's right. Acts 1 and 2. Until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proof being seen of them forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized you with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Yeah. He's bringing the Old Testament finish to the start of the New Testament. He finishes Luke with that same statement. And the first book we get into in the New Testament is the book of Acts. People ask me, you know, uh, it was kind of a joke when I was a kid. You know, what do you bring to to a, a fight you're bringing your axe in 238s. <laughs> some of you got that, some of you don't. <laughs> axe 238 is land of salvation. But anyway, so the Holy Ghost is this promise, but they hadn't had it yet. They didn't know what it was. Remember when you write something in historically, you're trying to put yourself in that old tense. When we tell stories, and the older we get, the more stories we tell. And the older we get, the more enjoying we because we, we can't go out and run. We like tough stories about how we used to go out and run. <laughs> Sometimes the stories get a little long. I know. That fish keeps growing every time we hear that story. But when, when, when the writers of the Gospels and the writer of Acts was writing, he was taking a historical view of something happening. Even when he's writing the book of Acts, these the, everything that is, is already happened in the book of Acts, so it's a historical look. So what he's doing is he's trying to bring understanding from why Jesus died and what promise was, was going to come. And so on Acts, he opens it up with bringing that last chapter of Luke to Acts, joining them together so we have a com complete understanding. If, if you call yourself an apostolic, if you believe in what the, 
the apostles taught. If you believe what they, they taught was what Jesus taught them, first-hand account, then you are apostolic. Y'all looking at me funny. No, I'm Baptist. I'm Mormon. I'm Miss Presbyterian. I'm Wesley. I'm all, no, you're not. If you believe what the Bible says, you're apostolic. Because if you're going to live and do like the apostles did, you have to follow their teaching. Come on. Amen? Come on. This, I hope it's making sense. I'll, I'll try to tie it up here. Not get too long winded. But anyway. So he, he's telling about this thing that's going to happen at the end of Luke. Jesus promises something mighty. It's going it's to be powerful. It's going to be amazing. Something is going to be life changing. And what we do is, is historically in church, I'm, I'm saying this in general sense, churches in general, when you get away from something, what it is changes. Okay? How many know that, that we all look back on our youth and we were so strong and we were so big and so good looking? And then we see a picture of you in 1970 and we're like, wait, it's above 60. And you're four foot tall. He's a round tubby kid. That's not what you remember, but that's what was. We got a picture of it. Because the further you get away from something, your memory of it changes. You understand that? So, so there is this fire burning in Acts, the first chapter. Because there was a promise coming that Jesus said, look, my life was nothing compared to what's coming. I finished the Old Testament with my blood, but what's coming is going to be so powerful, it's going to change you. Come on. Come on. That's you right. You get into the first chapter of Acts. And if, let me just flip to it real quick. First chapter of Acts is... All chapters are important, but you have to, you can't read, you can't start a book in the middle. If you do, you lose the context of what it's saying. If I go to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave her the only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should have eternal life. Wait a minute. I forgot the whole context of the whole book. That's not the whole story. Come on. There's a whole lot more involved in there than just believing on the Lord Jesus and go on about your business. Ask people in the world. Everybody believes in Jesus. The Bible says the devils believe. That's right. But you're not unique in that. Everybody believes. But if you read the context of the, the Gospels and then into Acts and, and all the epistles, you see that there's actions required. Living for God is not something that I accept the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior and now I'm good, good to go. No, friend. That's like saying I marry her and then I walk away and never say hi to her, never spend. We, we, we're married in, in name only, but there's no relationship. Uh huh. She don't know me and I don't know her. When you get into church, you're not coming in and joining a club. You're walking into a spiritual, breathing, living experience that helps the owner. Just saying. Come on. Yes. I love these people at these, these Clemson. We knew something happened at Clemson yesterday. We had so much traffic. We couldn't get from food line to our house. It took 20 minutes. There's a whole bunch of believers in that team over there, huh? Yep. Acts, the first chapter, the seventh verse. And he said unto them, because these disciples, they had all these concerns about what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. They want to know when you're coming, what, what, what's going to work out. He said, look, listen, listen. It's not for you to know the time or season, Acts 7, uh, which the Father has put in his own power. Acts 1 and 8, this is the gist of it. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me preface something. Everybody says, well, tongues were for that day. I'm going to dispel that notion. Okay? I'm going to use the Bible to do it. Hopefully I can get it all done in two hours. Or, or order pizzas, okay? When you get away from something and start, and you get away from the experience of it, you, you lose the power of it. The further away you get from something, the less you're connected to it, the less relevance it is in your life. So to get close to what he's talking about, you have to get back into the book. Get back into the experience. If the apostles 
were waiting in Jerusalem for something to happen that was going to be life changing. Then, friend, I'm an apostolic. We can wait right here in this church until the Holy Ghost come like it did on them. Turn with me to the second chapter of Acts. They were in this upper room, 120 of them. They got together. They were, they were doing this command. And Luke uh, wrote that. He rewrote it in the first chapter of Acts. They got together and, and they, were, they were praying, God, we're waiting for something. We don't know what it is because we just don't know. You said we're going to promise coming. The Holy Ghost is coming. You're going to baptize them with fire. We just need to know what it is. So they're in a room praying. They don't know what they're praying for. They just know they have a promise that God's going to do something. And this is where we pick the story up. So they're all up there believing. And I'm sure it started with a thousand. Then after a period of time, it got down to 500. How many know prayer meetings start out with everybody earnest? And after a while, people start going. Standing. You know what you're left with? You're left with that hardcore. We're going to win it. That's right. We're going to take this valley. So it whittles them down to 120. And we pick it up in Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. suddenly. There came a sound from heaven. A what? A sound. A sound. Oh, kind of like service this morning. Listen, if you have no sound, when that baby comes out, you know what that doctor's praying for? Oh, come on, oh God. Come on. Come on. I've seen them. Rub them. Squeeze them. Come on. Come on. What do I need? I need the sound. Why? Because when he makes a sound, I know he's alive. <laughs> Why? He had a live birth because we had a sound. How about you go to that big old stadium over there and they all watch that game and nobody makes a peep? Well, that'd be boring. It's only exciting when we make noise. And the more noise we make, the more exciting it is. Right? God started this church with a sound. That shook that house. Uh -huh. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And appeared unto them cloven tongues like of the fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When they got the Holy Ghost, or let's just say Holy Spirit, what happened? I just read it to you. I gave you the answer. This is one of those you can't fail the quiz. Okay? <laughs> I'm giving you the answers as we go. They heard them speak in tongues. I've heard people say, well, that was just God using them to speak in different languages so that they could communicate to everybody in Jerusalem. Let me dispel that notion for you, okay? They were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, which is the Feast of Weeks, which they celebrate every year. Do you know what the Jews had in common? They had faith and they had language. You know what a Jewish baby was taught when he was born? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know what language they taught him back in? Hebrew. Because if you tie your children to their faith, they live. That little baby woke up. He was born. He was taught to Shema. And so when all those people got to that, that city of Jerusalem on the Feast of Weeks and the Holy Ghost came down and all these people busted out in tongues, the whole city was amazed. Saying, My God, what's going on in that room? And then these people, these Jews that lived in these different nations that spoke, everybody spoke four or five languages. The language of the day was Greek and Latin. But in each little nation, if you were living in Assyria, you spoke Assyrian. That was your home tongue. But to live in the Roman Empire, you needed to know Greek and Latin. And if you wanted to trade with different little nations, you had to learn their language. So Paul, they, they said Paul may have known five languages. Everybody. Go to, go to, go to Africa today. And go to Nigeria and ask them how many languages you know. Well, we got the mother tongue, we got our common tongue, we all, I mean, they got like 15 languages. That's how it was. These were Jews. They were one God, Jewish people. And when they saw this miracle, 
The tongues came not as a sign to repeat to these people that in their own language the wonderful works of God. The sign was, wait a minute. I know that's a Jerusalem person. And they may speak Greek and they may speak, but they don't speak Aramaic. And yet they're speaking. It was a sign. God gave a sign through the tongue that his spirit now dwelt in that body. Right. I've heard people say, well, that's just for back then. That didn't happen. You know, that was just on that one day. My own mom said that to me one time. Sorry, mom, if you're watching. I said, I'm not disagreeing with you, mom. I'm going to have to terribly disagree. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 8 chapter. 8 chapter of Acts. Wound up. Tell me when you got it. Acts, the 8th chapter. I'm going to give you a little timeline here so that you'll know. When you read a book, sometimes we forget to add time to that book. You know what I mean? You just read the book, and, you're, and unless that book gives you a timeline to follow, you think it's all happening in one day. So, Luke wrote this book, but he didn't necessarily give us a timeline, meaning on year 2, Acts chapter 3, on year four, Acts chapter five, he didn't do that. He just wrote what happened. But there is a timeline because we can follow the events of the Roman Empire by which uh, Caesar was in power and what law was passed. We have a timeline. So we knew when, when they, they go to certain places and, and that city was a certain type of city, well, it had to be that year because under, under the next guy, the next Caesar, he went and wiped that folks out. They weren't there the next year. So it had to be that year. So this is a timeline. If you think it only happened on the day of Pentecost, or the whole book of Acts happened on the day of Pentecost, you'd be wrong. Because in Acts 8, it's six years from the day of Pentecost. Six years. Acts 8 is six years from Acts 2. A lot happened in six years, trust me. Yeah. But to bring my story on, uh, Philip goes down to Samaria and he's preaching. He's preaching the word. And these Samaritans, which are half Gentile and half Jew, which to the Jews, they were nothing because if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But these were Samaritans. They had some promise in the Old Testament, but not much. And so... The Jews didn't think that God was going to give the gift that they got for their crowd to anybody else. But Philip's down there, and he's preaching to these Samaritans, and all of a sudden, they start receiving the word, the message that he preached. And, and, and so he rides back up to Jerusalem to the apostles and says, hey, I'm down here preaching to these folks, and they're believing it. What do I do? Well, the disciples in their, in their great wisdom... They said, well, listen, let's, let's do this. Let's send Peter and John down there to the Samaritans to preach a message of salvation. Now, we know what Peter preached on, on day one, Acts 2. Go to Acts 2.38. You can read it. Yeah. In Acts 8, they got this new group of people, and they received the word. And, and Peter and John in Acts 8, 14, pick it up. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Philip had the, had the formula right, but nobody's got the experience. If it were you get the Spirit... On the same day, if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then how could there be a sign of that in Philip? I'm just asking a question. I'm not doubting whether you got the Spirit or not. That's between you and God. I'm just saying the Bible gives us a clear indication of what's happening. Okay? The Bible says in Acts 8, 17, Then laid they hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. How did they know they received the Holy Ghost? Be bold, somebody. Right? Peter would be there to verify, don't you think? He preached the message in Acts 1. He gave the, he gave the commandment in Acts 2.38. He was there. 
if, there, if he had made a mistake, there was other disciples around. Hey, 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 you're off, man. That's not what he said. But they, nobody said anything. So he preached that message. And so they believed in the Holy Ghost came. And then in Acts 8, he comes. And he preaches the exact same message. Come on. And he prayed for them. And they got the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that he heard them speak in tongues. But why would he have to pray for them and lay hands on them if they accepted the Lord Jesus as the personal Savior and they got the Spirit that moment? He wouldn't have had to do nothing. He would have known they got it when they prayed. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't got it because the Bible just said they hadn't got it or it fell on none of them. But when they came and they laid hands on them, something happened. And they're, oh, yeah, 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 he got it. So just to broaden this a little bit, follow with me. I know you're not as excited as I am, but I, I'm excited. <laughs> Acts chapter 10, verse 44. You got to turn to your Bible. I've got to build up here so you, you, you get to where I'm at. Acts 10 is exactly 11 years after the day of Pentecost. <laughs> 11 years. Not, not next week, not next month, 11 years after the day of Pentecost. And, and Peter goes down to Cornelius' house and he prays for them and as he's preaching, uh, Acts 10, 44 says, well, Peter yet spake these words. He's preaching a message. The Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with him, with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? Well, we don't have to guess here because they wrote it down. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as we? This is 11 years later. If this was a one-off on the day of Pentecost, Peter would not be, this would all be a moot point. Right. But they're repeating because God is linear. He always brings everybody forward to the same point. Right. He don't change in the game. God didn't change his plan. He didn't change the plan of salvation. I don't care if some guy said just accept the Lord as personal Savior. Friend, that's not what the book says. That's right. That's right. We agree the book's the authority, right? That's right. Amen. Well, I don't always like what the preacher preaches, but if he's in the book, I better learn to like it. Come on. Come on. Right. When I said it, I believe it. Right. Mm. So he said, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answer Peter. So they baptized him in Jesus' name. In Acts 10, 40, and he commanded them. Baptism was not a suggestion. Wherever you get this notion that baptism is just you don't need to be baptized, wait a minute. What did John the Baptist come doing? Baptizing. That's why they call him John the Baptizer. That's right. Right, right. What was his job? He dumped people. What did Jesus do when he went to John the Baptizer? Well, he, he, he got baptized too. Then the Holy Ghost filled him. Well, that's, that's a sign, okay? What happened the day of Pentecost when Peter preached his message, Acts 2, 37, and they were pricked in their hearts and they said, men and brethren, what should we do? These, these guys are hearing this message from Peter. And then Peter says, repent, everyone, you can be baptized in Jesus' name. So he commanded them to be baptized. Baptism is a commandment because right here in, in, in Acts 10, and he, who, Peter, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Why? Because he was going to instruct and teach them. Hey, we need to know more about this. Yeah, we, we got the experience. We got a little bit of knowledge. We need to know more. Right. You know why? Because that hunger of the Holy Ghost wants to take things. I want more. Often I don't have to. I want more. Amen. This is just a side note, but you can study yourself. Turn to Acts 11. Don't turn there. I'm just going to tell you about it. Acts 11. So, um, Peter's got to make a report. He goes back up to Jerusalem. He's getting with the, all the, the 12 and all the other disciples and men up there. And they get in this room. And, and Peter walks in. And, and they're waiting to hear what happened. What happened with the Gentiles, Peter? And Peter gets up and he starts preaching his message. 
And he rounds it up with this, and you can read it in Acts 11. He said, and, and, and we were praying, and the Holy Ghost fell on them, like on us, at the beginning. That's a quote. The Holy Ghost fell on them, like on us, at the beginning. And you know what all those Jews were like? They were quiet. You know why? Wait a minute. This is getting poured out on everybody. Oh, yeah, because in Acts, the second chapter, Peter says, he's quoting Joel, I will pour it on my spirit upon all flesh. Yes. Right. All flesh. Who gets the Holy Ghost? Everybody. Yes. Yes. Who, who should want the Holy Ghost? Everybody. Yes. Yes. And once he confirms this to the apostles, they're like, man, man, man. Okay. We're all on board now. We realize that God is making this not a nation movement, not, not a Jewish movement. This is a world movement. Uh -huh. You know why? Because it's going to move from Jerusalem in 73 AD when Titus comes in and flattens that city. And it spreads Christianity all over the known world. Yep. Like it said, to every part. To the uttermost part. Yeah. So if you have any question about baptism or in the Holy Ghost, see the Emperor. But I'm, I'm not quite done. I'm still moving here. Give me 10 more minutes. Okay. I'll just two more. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. Acts 19. I've had people argue with me and debate with me and whatever. I like reading the word and letting the word speak to me what it says. Amen. If you take my license and, and you say, uh, you see, I read it to you on my license, it says Matthew. Alan Monroe, Matthew Allen, Allen, A L A N. Simple. I'm simple. That's my name. If you pick my license up and say Mateo, which is Spanish for Matthew, Allen, A L L E N, Monroe with a U, you're not pronouncing my name. You might be reading my license, but you're not saying my name. Because my name is Matthew, A C T H E W A L A N M O N R O E. Why? Because my name is important to me. Come on. Don't yell Alice, Alice, Alice and trying to get my attention because I won't turn around. Say, Pastor! Dub dub. Uh -huh. <laughs> you answer to truth. Your name is truth. See, so? If I kept referring to you as Fred after church, you'd be nice the first time. Grab my hand and say, Preacher, I think you know me. I've been coming here a while. I support you. I love you. But you keep calling me Fred. My name's never been Fred. <laughs> and never will be Fred. <laughs> so please stop referring to me as Fred. Or just go talk to somebody else. Why would God, why would God be any different? When he said his word is something, you can count on his word being exactly what oh. he said it would be. Amen. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. If they got the Holy Ghost were baptized in Jesus' name, way back gone, God is linear. In 2199, if there's a building in this property, they're going to be preaching what God at the time. Skinny and preaching for an hour. <laughs> Paul, who was really a disciple of Jesus, but he had some people in like Cornelius and, and the disciples. Let me tell you about Paul, okay? He was a brilliant man, not smart, brilliant. He was an incredible educator, incredible letter writer. He was at the zenith, as it were, of the knowledge of the Jewish culture. He was at the Zenith. He was a student of Gamaliel, who at the time was the greatest theologian of his day. To this day, the Jews still know that Paul was a great, he was a Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew his stuff. So if Paul got converted, do you think he would change his ways of doing things? Or would Paul, because he has this duty to find out truth, would he not go and get the exact truth of the word of God. Right. And then repeat it. And repeat it. And repeat it. Turn with 
read of Acts, the 19th chapter. Just for your little timeline there, if you can write it down, Acts 19 is 26 years after the day of Pentecost. Acts 19 and 1. This is Paul, and it says, And it came to pass, Luke's writing this, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. How would he know that they were disciples? Because they had something about them. You can tell when somebody's hungry for God. Mm -hmm. I can tell. I don't care what they look like, smell like, talk like. When someone comes back through the back door and they sit down in church service, I can tell they're hungry for God. Yep. Why are you here, man? I just got been doing this. Been reading some things in the Word. I, I, God's the only one. I'm hungry for the Word. And there we go. So he finds these disciples. And, and he's got these... Paul gets to the nut of things. I don't know if you read any of the Anybody read Romans? He gets right to the problem. Read Romans 1. Scare tar out of you. Don't be a sinner if you read Romans 1. It's right to the nut. So in Acts 19, 2, he said unto them, I'm sure he has some pleasantry, shakes his hand, love you guys. Hey, by the way, because Paul ain't got a lot of time. He's getting right into it. He, say, he says unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Well, sure, we accept the Lord Jesus as a personal Savior. I got the Spirit of God in me. That's not what he asked. That's not what he asked. That would be an assumption on his part. He wouldn't have to ask that, right? right. To be assumption. To be assumed. He said, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they say, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. What they were saying is, man, we ain't heard that. We've been out of town. Remember what I told you? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have the New York Post. They didn't have the New York Times. The information wasn't there right away. It took sometimes years for something to get across the world. Man. So they had a form of religion. They understood John's teaching, but they didn't have anything beyond that because they had went out and started making disciples. And so he said unto them, in, in verse 19, he said unto them, unto what were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. They're being honest. They're disciples of John. And Paul doesn't diminish their experience. Do you understand that? Don't diminish somebody's faith. Right. Don't come in here and somebody said, man, I'm, I need to touch some God. I've been going to this certain type of church, and, but I just feel like there's more I need to touch. Well, don't dip down that church. That got them this far. Come on. Right. Let's just pick up on where they, they, they left off and let's just bring some more in there. That's right. And so Paul, Paul says, well, well, uh, then Paul said, John barely baptized, uh, baptized unto repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ. So he takes them from John's baptism and pulls them over to Jesus Christ. He's a crafty man. Then Paul, then said Paul, John barely baptized by repentance. Okay, we, uh, verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So as soon as they heard that there was more, they entered into the more. Don't push off if there's more in your life. Well, I don't know about getting baptized in Jesus' name. Well, we baptized Danielle and, and, and Trish on Trish and, and uh, who did I baptize on Christmas Day? Was that you, Trish? No, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Getting over 55 and hard to get this. <laughs> I knew I put somebody down in that water. <laughs> <laughs> Careful now. That's not mine. I don't do my problem no more. Anyway, so you come as far as knowledge is revealed, step by step. Jesus said, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. What are we doing? We're building your faith to where you need to be in God. I don't diminish what your experience is in the past. I'm saying if you haven't experienced more. Austin, is there more? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's more. Oh, yeah. Definitely a lot more. So they baptized him in Jesus' name. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. 26 years later, a completely different man preaching the message. Goes in and preaches a message. And the exact same thing happened again. Oh, come on. It just keeps happening. You know why? Because it was God's plan, not man's plan. 
Man can't keep nothing going. He can't keep a country going. He can't keep a lie going. He can't keep nothing going. Man is always changing. And the devil will always help man change what the word of God said. Yep. He went to eat. Eat have God said. Let's try to challenge the word of God. There's a lot of people that their faith is being destroyed because there's men not preaching truth. Come they on. bring them so far and leave them. Come on. I'm calming down, but I'm, we're going to crescendo here in a minute. Brother Austin, would you come play? I'm hoping you play ever how you want to play. But, man, when we start praying, I want you to fire it up. Luke, Luke records this entire book. Luke is memorializing. If you don't, if you think Luke was just taking things verbatim, no, he was there. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, he said, Luke is with me. When he wrote to Timothy, he said, Luke is with me. Luke was a, a lifelong friend of Paul. He followed him. He was a companion. He traveled. He was there on the island of, of Patmos. He saw the things that were happening. He heard the messages Paul taught and, and, and the miracles Paul did. He, he participated he was a first-hand eyewitness of everything Paul did. And if Paul was making a mistake somehow and had gotten off from what Peter was teaching, don't you think that Luke would have pulled Peter aside? I mean, Paul aside, hey, hey, Paul, that's a little off because that's not what Peter said. I know because I'm writing it down. Don't you think there would be, if, 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 Luke was really Paul's friend. If Paul was getting along, if things had changed, Luke would have notified Paul. So, hey, things have changed. Didn't like that anymore. But that's not what he said. He copied down verbatim all that transpired for 30 something years of the ministry of Paul. We have a record. <laughs> and that record always carries the same message at the beginning. The fire fell. They spoke in tongues. They were commanded to be baptized in Jesus' name. That's, I'm sorry, friend, if you don't believe that. It's, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to argue with you. I, it's not a debate. It's, it's not an argument for me. It's not a debate. Go to Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And a lot of people always pick up on that word shall. Who's ever trying to call on the name of the Lord shall be saved? Yes! I love that word shall, don't you? That leaves out the maybes. I like that shall. But he just said, if you repent, you're baptized in Jesus' name, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because that's the promise that Jesus told the disciples that Luke were born in Luke and were born in Acts. You will get this gift. And these things will be the sign of it. I've heard people say, well, that was just for that time. Well, I'm going to argue with you. Because the verse after that, Acts 2.39 says, for this for the promise, this promise, is unto you. That's, that's this generation, not, not today, but their generation. Unto your children, that would be the next generation. And to all those that are far off, that's, that's those in other countries. Because the word's going to get that far. And it says, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Who gets the promise? The call. The call get the promise. Well, brother Monroe, I just don't know. I'm, I'm sometimes I'm afraid. I hear y'all speaking in tongues and, and it kind of freaks me out. I'm not used to that. Of course you're not used to that. Nobody's ever taught you that. I'm a little kid. I was like four years old. If you doubt when I give you memories of my memory, you ask my wife. I may not remember what I had for pizza yesterday or that I baptized Trisha on Christmas Eve. 
But I can tell you what I did when I was two years old on Tuesday in 1971. I don't know how, but it's there. The first time I heard somebody speak in tongues, I was in a church in, in Bakersfield, California. My mom had that big old hairdo when had that Quaker oak jar in the middle and you wrapped your hair around like that. And sometimes when she'd shout the Quaker and wink at people. I remember watching her shout. And this man that was back, I was in the second row, like this. And this man in front of me started speaking in tongues. And I heard him. Now, when I was a little kid, I didn't think about it. But a million times from that day, I thought about it. I heard that man speak in tongues 50 some years ago. And here I am today, 2024. Listening to Austin and Austin and Andrew and Stephanie and Tom and all these people speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. God ain't changed, I guess. That's right. Let me tell you what the Holy Ghost does for you when He's in you. What are we doing? We're coming out of this flesh. 
we're entering into the spirit. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Bible said when Peter stood up preached, he said, these are not drunk as ye suppose, but this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. I know you think they're acting crazy, but this is not just them acting crazy. This is that which was spoken of the Spirit. When you get the Holy Ghost, you don't have to fight God. Don't fight God. Just come down. Get your altar. Repent. Just, God, I'm sorry I'm living this way. Help me to change. You just repent. You raise your hands to God. Block out everybody around you. You're getting the Holy Ghost, not them. Raise your hand to God. And with your voice, begin to praise and worship Him. And say, God, fill me with your spirit. You can get the Holy Ghost before you get baptized, or you can get the Holy Ghost after you're baptized. All you have to do is allow God to enter this body. But you have to use your lips to worship Him. You're not going to get the Holy Ghost quiet because we can't hear it. You're going to get the Holy Ghost worshiping God because your voice is going to change from an earthly tongue into the heavenlies. It's going to be a language you don't even know. It's going to be the greatest experience you've ever felt in your life. I'm going to open this altar. Come on, some of the senior saints got the Holy Ghost. You need to be down here first. And then if you want the Holy Ghost, you just 